The sea was dark and patient. The Russian spy ship sat where it had sat for days, 15 miles off the coast, listening. Its radio and signals teams had been picking up launches and chatter for weeks. It logged patterns. It thought it could see the future. The ship thought it could stop strikes before they started. But the sea grants favors to those who learn its ways. Three Ukrainian FP-1S left a launch point and raced over the water. The FP-1 is a long-range, one-way strike drone built for deep attacks. It can go far and hit hard. It is cheap to make and quick to launch. These three were plywood and fuel and small engines. They were basic. That simplicity would be their advantage. A four-post R patrol drone was on station farther out. The four-post R carries a stabilized camera turret that can read tiny details at a distance. Its sensors can find moving machines against a crowded sea. Its operators relied on that detail to keep the coast safe. But the FP-1S were not like other threats. They hugged the water. They flew three meters above the waves. They were not metal birds. They were wood. Their radar cross-section was tiny. Their thermal signatures cooled fast in salt air. The four-post R saw a blip. The thermal screen showed a brief flicker. The operator labeled it a likely bird and moved on. Near shore, a second act was beginning. Ukraine launched a swarm of cheap sea drones and modified boats. These crafts were designed to look like Magura 55 naval drones on radar and on radio. They moved in formation. They used predictable attack patterns. They even played the right electronic signatures. To the Russians watching, it was the largest swarm since earlier battles. Every signal and every path was meant to tell one story, an all-out assault heading for the coast. The plan was to make enemy commanders believe the apparent threat was real. The Russians took the bait. The doctrine said to send helicopters. The Car 27 PL anti-submarine helicopter is the fleet's quick answer. It can cover hundreds of kilometers in an hour. It carries depth charges and dipping sonar. It hunts low and fast. The Admiral launched the Col 27 PLs and expected them to cut the threat down. The helicopters roared away, west, chasing the decoys. Each minute they burned heading west was another minute the real threat moved east. The sea was filled with false shapes while the sky emptied of defenders. Two Podlet K-1 radar stations watched the sector. They rotated at a steady speed, like searchlights sweeping the night. For long stretches, they pointed away from the same dark corner. That corner became a corridor, two kilometers of sky where a small, fast drone could slip through. Ukrainian watchers timed the FP-1S to hit that corridor when the radars aligned wrong. It was not genius. It was a patient observation. Patterns reveal their own weaknesses when you watch long enough. The decoy fleet did more than look real. It acted real. It split and scattered. It beached on empty shorelines. It slowed and sped like a unit about to strike. It burned the patrol boat's fuel and the helicopter's time. It forced commanders into the visible problem. It took the predictable path a fleet would take when faced with a threat. That predictability was the point. The Russians had visibly reacted. The Ukrainians turned that training on its head. Back at sea, the spy ship and its patrol escorts kept their screen up. The ship used Mineral ME radar and a web of sensors to see far beyond the horizon. Mineral ME is built to find surface targets and feed that data to weapons and craft. The system is powerful. It is meant to make a fleet hard to surprise. But powerful things have limits. They assume certain physics. They assume steady skies and the right angles. They assume the enemy fights by similar rules. Wood and waves make odd partners. The FP-1S dropped below radar clutter. The sea returns noise that hides small, low flyers. The plywood has cooled to water temperature. Thermal cameras that track metal heat could see nothing. The drones vanished into the weather and physics. The patrol boats and the spy ship saw a damaged drone fall into the water, and another buzz passed. They saw what was obvious. They did not see the small, blind point closing on their bridge. Electronic warfare then came alive. Russian units tried to jam navigation signals. The R-330 Je Zitel is one tool used to confuse GPS. It can broadcast false signals. It can nudge a guided craft from its course. The attackers had seen jamming before. They prepared for it. They used visual fixes. They taught machines to check known points at sea. Jamming slowed some drones, broke others, 
and walked one into the water. But not all countermeasures worked the same. The simplest tricks resisted high-tech lies. One FP-1 lost GPS and drifted. Its inertial system bled error. Over salt water, without regular fixes, it wandered into an empty sea and died with no flash. The second drone's capacitor failed from cold stress, and it sank without glory. The lead drone was what the plan needed. It spooled down to a compass heading when it felt a lock. It shut off radios and sensors, and kept flying on mechanical gyros. It had one job and a short clock. The spy ship's own protection made things worse. Its jammers reached across bands to block small craft links and drone controllers. Those emissions, powerful and broad, cluttered their own sensors. Every time the ship's EW system shouted, the ship's radars heard less. This is a danger called electromagnetic fratricide. Systems in a tight space can drown each other. The noise weakens returns and creates holes where a tiny wooden drone can slip through. Morning fog thickened. A strong temperature inversion bent radar beams up. And a beam that should have scanned 50 meters above the surface was actually looking 80 meters high. Anything below 30 meters became a ghost. A drone three meters above the water ceased to exist for the search systems. The patrol boat saw only quick shapes now. The Q-27PLs remained out chasing the Phantom fleet. The damaged FP-1 limped. A patrol boat caught sight of it at 500 meters. Tracers stitched the air. The mount poured rounds into the shape. Bullets cut through plywood. One round nicked the propeller. The engine misfired and shook. The drone kept flying. Its last fuel gave it a final glide toward the ship. At the bridge, watchstanders scanned the wrong sectors. Men trained to observe and report followed the call signs and vectors fed by the ship's systems. The machine said, look here. The men looked there. They trusted months of data. They did not expect an attack from below the radar horizon, from a thing the sensors could not see. Then the third drone appeared from a blind angle. It came at low altitude, fast and true. It smashed the bridge where the masts and antennas sat. Electronics, arrays and processors died in a single white roar. The R381T arrays that had picked apart radio chatter for weeks were twisted into molten art. The ship's records and six weeks of pattern of life data became burnt stories in black metal. The sensors that once fed responses and warnings were gone. Fire took the deck. Secondary blasts chewed through power rails and wiring. For 18 hours, the vessel burned, immobile and mute. It would sail again, but its eyes and ears were ruined. Weeks of intelligence were gone. Dozens of recorded launches, trajectories, and signatures that could have predicted and stopped future strikes were lost in moments. That loss changed the math. Without that repository of patterns, Russian commanders had to assume less. They had to retake the sky and sea with more forces. They had to spread attention over more places. For Ukraine, the result was simple. Launch sites that once fed predictable routines became blind again. Missile strikes and raids hit empty fields more often. The enemy had to guess. Guessing wastes time and resources. This fight was not a single clever trick. It was months of watching. It was a patient study of spin rates and formation patterns. It was testing what a radar could see when beams bent in the morning cold. It was turning human habit into a weapon. It was using cheap boats to look like a big fleet. It was making noise where silence would be expected. It was learning that sensors lie when the world tilts. The cost for Ukraine was small. Wooden drones, cheap sea craft, and timing. The cost for Russia was a container of secrets and a ship without senses. The sea had become a classroom. The lesson was not about one equipment model. It was the gap between complex systems and simple physics. It was about how human predictability can be mapped, then exploited. After the strike, the attackers moved launch points and changed timing. They introduced new patterns. They scattered the ways they worked. The Russians could still strike launch fields. They could still punish sites. But now they struck places that were empty or quickly rebuilt. The value of the lost signals bank could not be replaced by firepower alone. For commanders on both sides, the strike proved a truth older than radar. Sensors give you power, but sensors feed on patterns. Remove the pattern and the sensor has only guesswork. Systems meant to be tight and integrated can be fragile when the enemy plays a different game. In a quiet sea now, drones still fly, patrols still watch. 
helicopters still answer alarms. But every new sortie remembers the wooden birds that slipped below the beams. Every chart has a blank that was once full of data. The sensor net still hangs over the water, but the net has a new hole. The strikers know it. The defender must assume it will be found again. The strike ended more than a ship. It ended with certainty. It turned complex tech against itself and let a few simple machines do what soldiers and expensive systems could not. The sea keeps its stories. Today, a ship sails with fewer eyes. Today, another crew must learn to watch the corners their systems never intended to see. 